So good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to uh, our uh, audience from wherever you are in the world. Um, I'm Dipali Dewan, the Dan Mishra Curator of South Asian Art and Culture at the Royal Ontario Museum. And I'm delighted you could join us today uh, for, for the Curator Conversation a digital program that explores themes and subjects from Ram's collections alongside scholars and industry professionals. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank TD for their ongoing support of the program. Before we begin, and even though we're meeting here virtually, I'd like to acknowledge that the Royal Ontario Museum sits on what has been the ancestral lands of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Anishinaabeg Na Nation, including the Mississaugas of the First Credit Nation since time immemorial to today. I personally want to acknowledge the communities who've has, who have historically lived and cared for this land that I live and work on and who still do so today. I also want to acknowledge the legacies of colonialism, violence and extraction that have and continue to challenge that relationship to the land. And I invite us to reflect on that past and present my own journey of learning in a spirit of respect, sincerity, and appreciation is ongoing. Today's program is in support of the exhibitions, The Cloth That Changed the World, India's Printed and Painted Cottons, and the exhibition Florals, Desire and Change. So these two exhibitions um, explore uh, how Indian fabric revolutionized art, fashion, and science wherever they went around the globe. How over thousands of years, artists in India perfected techniques of dyeing and printing, and how India's cotton fabrics shaped today's global economy. We would like to acknowledge the support of our Royal Exhibition Circle donors in making these exhibitions possible. I'm also happy to report that, these, that both these exhibitions have been extended until the end of the year. So once the, the ROM reopens, and according to Ontario's um, pandemic reopening schedule, that is end of July, uh, there'll be ample time for hopefully some of you to see these displays. And on the screen, you can see a view of um, the Cloth That Changed the World exhibition below. So today's program takes a deeper dive into a few sections in the exhibition. One of them exploring the techniques and substances involved in the dyeing of cotton, and the other on the consequences of the global desire for India's colorful cotton that led to industrialization, slave labor, and environmental pollution, among other things. Specifically, we're going to look at one plant. Um, the, what gets called Che or uh, Cheavar. This humble in appearance, but profound in its impact, uh, it was the source for the rich red color of India's cotton textiles uh, from the South um, that they had become famous for. Um, in fact, uh, you can see an image of the plant uh, on the screen on your top left. At the ROM, we did testing of some threads uh, for their dye source uh, from textiles in the ROM's collection um, that revealed the, um, the use of Che. Um, and um, it was, um, there was actually several sources of red dye uh, used in India, particularly Western India as in the fabric examples on the right side of the screen, which were mostly made in Western India. Uh, and you can see how that red color has a kind of orangey red quality to it, but nothing compared to Che. And these are some examples uh, from the exhibitions of fabrics used, uh, dyed with that red color, that amazing kind of cherry red, very deep red that came from the Che root. Um, and this was particularly proper, popular in Europe, especially with the Dutch, um, who um, uh, had a great desire uh, for these particular fabrics. Che is grown only in southern India and northern Sri Lanka. Sometime in the 1900s, I understand, knowledge of it, um, knowledge of dying with it was lost. 
um, and it has not yet been revived despite some efforts. Um, and so uh, it is a great focus of activity and interest. Um, and so with that today, I would like to invite, um, welcome our guests uh, for today's conversation on costs of desire, ethics of production in historic chintz, which explores the intertwined histories of textile dye and production in South Asia and considers recent scholarship on slave labor in Sri Lanka. Uh, so welcome um, to our guests and I will introduce them now. So um, Bessie Cecile um, is with us. She is an alumnus of the College of Arts and Crafts in Chennai and the head of the unit of the Craft Education and Research Center at Kalakshetra Foundation in Chennai. She obtained her PhD in textile design and conservation from the University of Madras in 2010. She's been awarded various research fellowships, including a visiting fellowship at the Victorian Albert Museum in London, a Nehru fellowship in 2006, and a Fulbright doctoral and professional fellowship at Florida State University. She was a research associate uh, in 2007 to eight for the Craft Education and Research Center at Kalakshetra Foundation, during which time her primary focus was exploring natural dyes and design creation. And as a research fellow at the Asian Civilizations Museum in Singapore, she researched hand dyeing techniques and conducted a dye analysis on trade textiles from the Coromandel Coast to Southeast Asia. She was re rewarded a research fellow fellowship by INTAC in New Delhi in 2015 to 16, where she focused on hand weaving techniques practiced in India, which resulted in a book titled Weaving India. And in 2015, she was also a Charles Wallace Fellow at the British Library. We are thrilled to have her here today. Uh, our second guest is Mark E. Balmforth, who is a Social Science and Humanities Research Council Postdoctoral Fellow in the Department of Historical and Cultural Studies at the University of Toronto Scarborough. His work analyzes inherited inequality in histories of encounters between South Asians, Europeans, and Americans. His first book project, uh, titled Schooling the Master, Caste Supremacy and American Education in British Ceylon, charts the entwining of caste nation and gender in American missionary schools in Ceylon. And Mark's second major research project, tentatively titled Buried Legacies, Slavery and Caste in the Indian Ocean, rethinks connections between enslavement, caste, and migration in the Indian Ocean by tracing the 300-year odyssey of an oppressed caste Tamil community known as the Dai Root Diggers from the 17th to the 20th centuries. His work has been published in the History of Education Quarterly, Review of Development and Change, and CAST, a global journal on social education, uh, as well as the International Journal of Asian Christianity. So, um, so today's presentation is a continuation of our exploration of cotton and color in India, and I'd like to welcome Bessie and Mark to the conversation. Uh, so we are going to start off with hearing from our guest speakers, um, each one at a time, who will share a bit more about their work, their thoughts uh, around this topic. Um, you can submit your thoughts um, and questions via the Q&A feature um, on the screen at any time during the course of the program, and then we will save time at the end to address uh, some of these questions and comments. So um, I will invite um, Bessie Cecile to start by unmuting herself and uh, going ahead. Yeah. Welcome, Bessie. Good yeah, good morning and thank you. Uh, thank you for giving this opportunity. Good morning and good afternoon and good evening to everyone. And uh, it's a great honor for me today to be talking about the subject which I'm very passionate about. I'm going to briefly run through how I, you know, uh, came in contact with Cherud. So this was, 
I always wanted to, I, I'm going to be more, uh, or what you say, narrative, what I experienced I'm going to be talking about. I always wanted to become an artist. You know, I love painting. I draw well, not now though. And uh, so I joined this college, College of Arts and Crafts, and they said, uh, you know, you're not good enough. So you have to take textile design. I was so unhappy, but then I was convinced because my grandmother was a lace designer. You know, uh, it's a, a Honiton lace designer. It, during the Brit British time only, she, she was the first Indian to be appointed. And uh, so I thought maybe, you know, there is a calling. So my journey began as a textile designer. And I did my undergrad and my post-graduation also in textile design. When I realized, when I completed my post-graduation, I realized I didn't know anything about design to be more precise about Indian design or whatever design I was doing, how it is going to be translated onto the fabric, whether it can be printed, painted, or, you know, oven. I had no clue and I had nothing, no knowledge at all. So my next thought was probably, you know, I should do my PhD. You know, then I'll be enlightened. My thought was that. And well, you have to be, you know, you have to my, I, uh, really know that I cannot read or write. I am a person with learning disability. So I know how to hold a brush and not a pen. Or I can't even read or write properly. So the issue that here, I, I, I didn't even think of the, uh, you know, I had the idea that I have to read so much, understand so much, write so much for PhD. Almost two years, I looked out for a guide because for textile masters in textile design, I couldn't find a, a, a department or, a, you know, a professor or a supervisor who could really guide me. After two years, I landed up in government museum, Chennai, Madras government museum, and there is this chemical conservation and research laboratory. They said, there is an opening in textile. So I go there. They said, it's textile conservation, Bessie, and Probably it can be interdisciplinary. You can have your textile design by the side. I said, okay. The point is, I didn't even know what was textile conservation. I didn't know the meaning of conservation. I ran to my professor. I asked, sir, no matter what, I want to do my PhD. And what is the meaning of conservation? So he laughed and he said, this is what it is. So science, science, it's not going to happen. I'm not, I don't think so I can do it. He said, you can do it. So let's start working. Long story short. I managed to get into the, you know, get my admission for my PhD program. And then the next challenge starts. What is the area of focus? You know, I, I, I thought I'll do cotton textile in general. So in cotton, when I started, everybody knows, but, but I was so naive. I didn't have that, you know, I was so foolish. I didn't know so much. And uh, when I started reading, it was an ocean and it kept coming. And finally, I decided there was one textile which I was following throughout, which is called the Kodali Karpur. I, I think that the next slide will be that. Can you? Yeah. It's, this particular textile uh, was the one, it has a story. If I go into it, it will be more than 10 minutes. So I'm not going to go into how I came to know about the, this textile. I decided this textile is a lost tradition. It's not over there. It is uh, actually cotton. This cotton is not existent anymore. The technique, it is hand painted. It's not existent anymore with the resins. Plus uh, dye painted, everything, everything is lost. And the, there is a metal thread which is used, which is again uh, hand, handmade. Even that is lost, a complete, everything is lost in total. So I decided let's do it because there was one textile in the government museum. So I, I, I chose that. In this text, and this is called Kodali Karpur. Usually the name, uh, the, the name of the textile or the tradition is after the place where it is woven. So Kodali Karpur is a place in South India, closer to Kanjavur. And these textiles were particularly woven for the Maratha uh, royals in Tanjavur. And uh, it was, uh, it's made of cotton. It's more of cotton brocade, dresses drawn, uh, painted and dyed, you know, name it, and everything was there in it. And uh, predominantly, the color was red. There was some, there is a few textile with darker shade of, you know, more of maroonish with a little bit of black and darker uh, blue. But, you know, those are living tradition. That is black and blue are living tradition. But this red was something, you know, very different. 
And uh, so the, my professor said, Bessie, why don't we focus on the red? I said, okay, so let's do it. So when I started the literature survey, it was the Che route. Everywhere the Che route came up, Sayaware or the Olden Landia Ambulator. And uh, the next plant, so let's assume this is plant A. And the next plant was uh, 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 Rubia cordifolia, then Morinda citrifolia. So let's say plant A, B, C, D. So five plants. Then it was Ventilago, Madrasa, Patina, and the Sapan node. Uh, don't bother about the botanical name. Let's, you know, for the uh, easy understanding, let's go by A, B, C, D, E. So these five plants uh, was, are the ones I identified. And, you know, I decided, well, here we get the raw material from a country medicine shop. So I went to the shop and I asked, you know, I want Sayaware. They gave me, uh, you know, they gave me this. And then they, I asked for Rubia cordifolia. They gave me this. They, I asked for Ventilago. They gave me this. And they, I asked for Sapan. They gave me this. And I asked for, well, you know, everything. I asked, they gave me. And I came, I did the, uh, you know, prepared the standards, extracted the dye from the historical textile and placed with the standards when I compared, the, I didn't get the results. This, you have, oh, 2003, I, I registered for my PhD. 2009, I couldn't get the results. You know, I, there were other elements also which I researched, but this textile, I mean, dye analysis was a major failure, but I, I was awarded my PhD in the year 2010. But you know, that nagging feeling you wouldn't rest. If I got my PhD, but what joy is so much, I didn't, I didn't get the results. This nagging feeling, you know, I kept, I continued researching. At that point in uh, Calcutta, there was a conference that was coming up, organized by the Sutra, which was part of Botanical Survey of India, was also contributing to the um, uh, exhibition. So my plan was to go there and understand the plant. What does this plant, how does it look like? I just cannot go to a shop and find some dried root. There's no authenticity. So I went there, understood the plant in from the herbarium and the distribution. So the di distribution was more of South India. It, it's everywhere. But what collection they had was more of more from the South. So I came back to Chennai, came back to Chennai and went to Madras Christian College campus to the botany department. I said, show me a live plant. I've seen the herbarium, show me a live plant. So they just stepped out and they said, it's here, you know. So I said, is this the plant? They said, is this is the plant. And can I have it? They said, you're not touching it because we are protecting our plant. So next time, whenever I walked into the campus, literally, you know, they would stare at me. Whenever I had a doubt, they were very careful. And they really, that's a very nice thing they protected. So coming out of the campus, everywhere I see this plant, but I'm not able to pull it out. I dig it because it's so small. I pull it out. It's just, you know, the root is almost a meter or two meter deep. And it's just this, this thick only. You know, it's like three mm or max four mm. That's it. And the root bark is used. And I couldn't find. So, but, and uh, meanwhile, I got my postdoctoral studies at the Asian Civilizations Museum. So apparently, when I went to Calcutta, there was somebody who said, Bessie, you have to meet this particular person. I said, okay, for what? They said, no, you have to meet. So I met her. And she said, I'm from uh, uh, Heritage Conservation Center from Singapore. And uh, she handed over, uh, uh, you know, uh, two uh, sheets of paper. I said, yes, thank you. And I, I, that was it. Then third day, I was here in Chennai. And I was unpacking and I come across what's this. I open and that it says a postdoctoral fellowship for dye analysis of textiles that were traded from Coromandel Coast to Southeast Asia. And believe me, that was the last day. And I was heartbroken, heart shattered. But then I didn't give up. I just wrote a mail saying, give me 24 hours. I'm interested in applying. They waited. They obliged 24 hours. I applied and I got it. And the journeys began. I said, I, in, in my proposal, I said, six months, I will do my field trip because I wanted to be, what mistake I made earlier, I didn't want to commit again. I know Che is going to be difficult. So this was, I was parallelly working and parallel, this came, I applied, then I come back to India, then the real journey starts. And um, I couldn't find the, I find Che route, but I could not get enough to die. 
I was into a lot of trouble. Then I thought, okay, let me keep the che aside and collect other plants. So other plants, when I went for, to, you know, from south of Orissa to tip of uh, Cape Comrade, that is Kanyakumari, for east of Western Ghats uh, to the Coromandel Coast, the length and breadth across, I, I went, I, my uncle drove me around every place, everywhere we'll stop, everywhere we look at the plant, everywhere we, we, we kept going because we couldn't collect. So meanwhile, I collected all the other plants and uh, finally I come to Kalakshetra because natural dyeing is happening, extensive, still happening. And then also it was happening. So I go to one of the teacher there and said, sir, he's from Andhra, he's a Kalamkari artist. So I said, sir, I want this uh, Ventilago Madrasa Patana. So my understanding Ventilago Madrasa Patana is a creeper, I mean, meaning climber. He, he was telling, no, it's a tree. So we had an argument. So he said, come, I'll show you the plant. I said, let's go, sir. So next we have, the stop is Andhra. And uh, it's not too far, it's kind of a border. So you could say like 100 kilometers from here, from Chennai. And uh, we had to cross a for dam and a forest area. So he said, I have to show. It is a long walk. And um, we went and as at that particular time when we were going, the dam was kind of dry. And we took a short cut across the dam. And when we got down, it was full of chair root. And, you know, everything changed after that. And that plant, whatever we came for, that was not what I was looking for. But then, yes, here I found the chair. And then we co I collected the plant, and this place is uh, in the, near Kalahasi. It's the forest is called Kalengi, and from there uh, I brought it. We prepared the samples, and the raw material were taken to Singapore. And from there, uh, hist from the historical textiles, the uh, and yarn were collected, and uh, everything was sent to Japan. And Dr. Saito was the one who can uh, did the HPLC. Uh, and out of 14 textiles, 11 were identified with Che root. And that was a huge success. And this journey in search of root, you know, it was kind of, uh, you know, what do you say? Uh, understanding, it, gave a, it changed my thought process completely. And uh, I was wondering why, why people are after red, why there is so much of importance. Probably there is a scientific, you know, uh, connection to it. Because red, you, you see the most everywhere in the universe, the signals are red. Why infrared? Your eyes naturally get attracted. There is a scientific reason behind it. So with or without a knowledge, we are attracted towards, towards red. And dying with, and this is one of the textile which you see on the screen. I think the same piece even the ROM has. This was also analyzed for the Che root. And uh, yeah, it is a Che root and uh, you have this. And there are two or three pieces like this across the world. I think one tapi also has a similar one. Anyway, so this is my journey, you know, in search of Cherut. And I think I have to give time for the next speaker. So thank you for this. And I'm waiting for questions. Bessie, thank you so much for sharing your journey, really in search of Cherut. First, your journey that led you to textiles, and then your journey to actually look for Cherut. And I will never forget recently you told me that you that the detailedness with which you look and examine textiles that you, you said everyone is unique. Everyone has a different process involved. So we try to generalize our, our textile you know, techniques, but in fact, for you, everyone is unique and, and that's gonna stay with me for a while. So I'll invite um, Mark to unmute himself and Mark, please share with us um, uh, what your work has has been on. Thank you so much, Deepali, and, and I want to thank you and Sarah Fee for the invitation today and Aaron Carr for helping take care of us uh, logistically. Um, talking this week about Che um, is quite apropos because later in this week on Saturday uh, is the 19th of June, which here where I'm speaking from in America is Juneteenth, um, the, the, a holiday celebrated across the country, uh, celebrating the uh, emancipation of people enslaved in this country. And so um, I am appreciative to be talking now and appreciative for Ram um, inviting us to talk today um, and I hope that you take from uh, my few minutes before you um, 
uh, a little bit of a sense of, of the interconnections, the interweavings uh, between Che and, and South Indian textile history and the global history of slavery. So uh, you see before you um, a set of maps. I just wanted to make sure that um, when I'm referring to Jaffna or Menar, everyone is aware of where I'm talking about. Um, uh, Jaffna is a peninsula at the north of, of Sri Lanka, uh, then Ceylon. Uh, Manar is a small island um, just south of Jaffna, and there are a group of islands uh, between these two places that were really critical for the 17th, 18th, and early 19th century uh, Che uh, industry uh, in Ceylon. Um, in my talk today, I'm going to be walking through a group of evidence uh, that helps chart the early modern odyssey of a community that was responsible for digging this route um, that was uh, necessary for the red dye used in chintz production both in Ceylon and across the Coral Mandel coast. Um, though the narrative is going to be, um, it's going to provide an impressionistic portrait of the community story from the 17th century to today, I hope that it encourages you to consider Che dyed South Asian textiles as part of the global history of slavery. So if we can move on to the next slide. The first little bit of uh, evidence that I want to provide for you is from Philip Baldius, who was a Dutch uh, minister, part of the Roman, uh, part of the uh, Dutch Reformed Church, who traveled with the VOC uh, through South, South India and was based in Jaffna um, from uh, 1658 uh, into the latter part of the 1660s. He writes, at the time of our first arrival in 1660, we found the affairs of Nagapatnam in no, no small confusion, the city having been just before besieged by the Nayak of Madurai. Besides this, the king of Visapur had not long before the siege made an inroad into the country, and by destroying all the fruits of the earth and whatever else he met with, occasioned such a famine that the poor country wretches being forced to fly to the city for want of rice and other eatables, you saw the streets covered with emaciated and half starved persons who offered themselves to slavery for a small quantity of bread. And you might have brought, bought as many as you pleased at the rate of 10 shillings a head. Above 5,000 of them were there brought and carried to Jaffnapatam, as many to Colombo, besides several thousands that were transported to Batavia. And so here we see um, what Marcus Fink has described as a famine slave cycle, uh, where um, famine related to um, military incursions um, and, other, and other causes um, resulted in huge numbers of people uh, being forced to sell themselves into slavery. The Dutch capitalized on this um, and um, as far, as far as we know, the dye root diggers were purchased at this point and then later and brought to Sri Lanka, brought to Ceylon. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, the next piece of evidence is from Lawrence Peel, who was a, um, a Dutch colonial um, governor of the island, who in the process of describing um, the group of slaves that were working for the company at the time and their different labors says, then there are 348 of the company slaves who are diggers of dye roots. These pay four phantoms as poll tax. The company claims the first child of the slaves, if a boy. No girls are claimed at all. None of the slaves mentioned receive any support from the company. They live by themselves like other people, but have to be always ready for service. Only if they be kept on duty so long as to prevent their earning a living, the company provides them with rice. And so here we can see not only is a, a member of the, um, the Dutch administration pointing out that, that these people are owned by the company and are digging dye roots for the company, um, but um, the company is benefiting from a local, um, uh, a local labor structure that was a system of taxation during the, the uh, monarchical period um, that uh, required certain communities to provide certain services. Uh, for the for the monarch or the company. And then the next slide, please. Moving forward about um, about 30 years, um, we have a Dutch order um, that says, 
As it became known that the dye root diggers residing in the island of Manar do cunningly make marriages with another class who are not diggers of roots, with the object of freeing their children and other descendants from such employment, we strictly enjoin that the children of such marriages be trained up in the service of dye root diggers. Those who in violation of this order register otherwise will lose their office and be fined nine rix dollars for each offense. And so here we can see that that there are creative mechanisms uh, that the community is using to try to escape the servitude, um, in this case, by mar marrying their children to communities that didn't, uh, that didn't uh, owe labor to the, to the company. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. I'm sorry this is so fast, but I want to pack in as much detail as possible. Um, next, we have a, um, a quote from um, Lawrence Peel, uh, yeah, let's see, there we are, Van Imhoff. So an, uh, another governor of Ceylon who's writing about 45 years later in 1740, he says, it is a point which deserves consideration whether the dye root price, which is at present so low and disproportionate, ought not to be raised for the encouragement of the dye root diggers here, who at present hardly, or hardly earn their dry rice by doing this work and have to be kept to it almost by force. Many even try to run away or look to other look for other work in order to escape from this servitude. I would be inclined to answer this question in the in the affirmative. So here we have a, a member of the upper echelon of the Dutch administration realizing that there is an instability in in the the labor relationship to this community and needing and encouraging an expanded uh, income because people keep running away from doing the work. Uh, next slide, please. The final piece of um, evidence that I want to point to um, is uh, from about 200 years uh, later in 1911. Uh, E.B. Denham was a colonial administrator in Ceylon and, and uh, was responsible for the Ceylon census of 1911. And in his explanatory remarks about that census, he talks about the community, the Dairut Diggers, about 100 years earlier, who at the time numbered 385 members. Um, and at that time, they, he estimated that they were able to collect 250,000 pounds of, of green root, not green color, but uh, fresh, raw, undried root, um, which accords with the amounts that we were given by the, the Dutch administrators, um, who often report somewhere in the range of 60 to 90,000 pounds annually, depending on the success of the, of the monsoons. Um, he says that in 1831, the monopoly was abandoned. By this point, uh, the trade had become, um, uh, the, the, the income provided by the trade was unstable. And so the, the company or the, the British government abandoned use, uh, abandoned their monopoly. The industry, he says, was uh, killed by the use of cheap manufactured dyes. This is um, slightly, um, this happens later. We can talk about this in the Q&A uh, if people are interested. Um, and then finally, he says that um, in 1891, there was, uh, he charts the precipitous decline in the numbers of the community and says that by the next census um, that came in 1921, he expected that there would be no more dye root diggers. So if we can go to the next slide. So part of my work um, is, is archival. Um, obviously, but part of it is also ethnographic. And so um, when I saw that quote from Edie Denham, I thought, I wonder if I can find people that identify as being dye root diggers today. And so over several years, um, uh, I, I've spent about two years living in Jaffna over the past 10 years. Um, I've been asking around, uh, going on a wild goose chase of sorts, looking for people who have some uh, historical connection to the root. And uh, in 2015, I um, ended up on this doorstep um, with a man who um, I'm, I'm not going to show his face or give his name for his privacy. Um, but uh, indeed, there are um, people who are the descendants of the Dairut diggers still living in Jaffna, still living in Manar, uh, and still living in, in uh, Karai Diva, Karai Nagar, uh, the island, one of the islands off, off the coast of Jaffna. Um, and we can talk a little bit about, um, about this community now, um, but uh, um, uh, it's important to recognize that there is this connection between um, slavery in the 17th and 18th centuries um, and contemporary caste oppression. And um, uh, so 
uh, I'm going to leave it there. And just in, in conclusion, I, I want to thank the ROM for, for providing this opportunity for us to, to be speaking about, about slavery and, and the consequences of, of um, the chintz trade. Um, and I hope that, that you're left with a, <clears throat> a sense of the connection between the chintz trade and, and the use of, of Che and the global history of slavery. Thank you. Mark, thank you so much uh, for this deep dive in the archive um, and, and finding evidence for um, what was required, what, what exploitive oppressive systems were required to supply this global desire for these bright red textiles. You know, it's, it's sometimes hard to trace those dots, you know, from the end product, which we all love and celebrate and admire, back to what are some of those real things that that have happened in order to make that happen and and you know uh, you know these are i think are are strings that we can see in today's world still um and so i'm going to stop sharing the screen uh bring us back yeah um I just have a couple questions I want to bring together both of your presentations and then we'll look to the chat on some of the comments and questions that have come in. Um, you know, I think the first thing I want to ask about and, and maybe Bessie you can start with this is, you know, just about the systems of education, you know, how was knowledge passed around about Cheirut in the past and to what degree is that does it still figure in training systems, maybe even the program you went through on textile design and, and conservation. To what degree does, does the use and knowledge about Cheirut, is it still present today? What do you find in, in your experience? Uh, oh, one, like I said, identifying the Cheirut itself was a challenge. I think um, when I started, I, whoever I asked, nobody knew how the plant looked, but everybody knew about the Cheirut. So there was uh, nothing that, you know, uh, what do you say? Um, for the analysis, like uh, for, for to prepare the standards, when we collected the sample, when I collected the, some chair root and I tried dyeing, I wouldn't get the dye. You know, it was a, a kind of a dirty beige color that I got. It was not even fresh. So that's the one I got. So, you know, when I really did that, I thought, should I take this to Asian Civilizations Museum? Because I'm looking for red and I get a beige here, but doesn't matter. So it's, it's a chemical that matters. So that kind of a confusion, it looks so ugly. So the, the actual knowledge, uh, you, you know, it's like a, a Guru Shishya uh, a Parampara, meaning from teacher to the student. And it's uh, it, 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 it's more of a word of mouth, uh, you know, knowledge sharing. And here we have, you know, if there is uh, 10 ingredients, usually we hold back one. Only nine, they teach the shishya. So suddenly they go, we you know, they die and they hold back the one important thing, the system is lost. So the actual effective of, you know, of dying, of, or the technique is actually lost. So even when the Britishers, when you find few records from 17th and 18th century, I don't think so. They really shared everything. You know, when they they might be thinking we are observing. You know, with the eye open, we do not know what they add when they add. That's a secret thing. So that we are not able to. You know, we here, here in fact, Burugapachatiya uh, Research Center and other research centers, we have been trying. We are not able, I'm not a chemist, so I usually tie up and help, you know, identify the plant and with the literature I give, and there are a few people who are trying and we are hoping for the best. So that's how the knowledge system is completely lost. So, yeah. So this disconnect, you know, between kind of past practices and, and the loss of knowledge today, could, could we get into that just a little bit more in terms of why it might have happened? So you were talking about, you know, there's a, a period of time where, you know, even though you know, British officials, Dutch officials might have written down what they were observing at the time as a process. They clearly didn't get it right, right? They either missed something or they weren't understanding what they were observing. So that formula, that recipe that is in the archive doesn't work, you know, or is not there. Um, 
Um, there's a, I'm going to mix a little bit of questions that have come in, um, but I think, and someone was asking about, it, and I think this plays into the story of, of the introduction of cheap dyes, you know, so where were they produced, by whom, when, you know, dyes that were uh, artificial or synthetically produced, you know, when were they introduced and what role did they play in the loss of that knowledge along the way? Um, maybe, uh, maybe Mark, we can start with you because you were about to say something and Bessie, come back to you. Yeah, I'll give just one example of, um, of, of the disconnect between colonial, primarily colonial um, uh, observations of, 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 of Che dying um, and actual practice. And, and water is a good example of this. If you dye, um, if you use Che to dye with water um, that's say in, in Chennai, um, you're going to end up with kind of a muddy brown color. Whereas if you do that dyeing in a place, say in Jaffna, that is um, on an aquifer that is coral, that water that you're using is, has been seeped in calcium. And so the pH is such that that same dye that comes out into the, into the water bath is going to be a brilliant red. And so, of course, Se several of the uh, colonial observers who are writing down this method and sending um, test samples back to London um, were not aware of the pH of the water or were not, maybe didn't see that perhaps in some places um, the dye baths were being created with lime, um, with, with burnt seashells that turns into, into the white, um, uh, uh, white lime that can adjust the pH such that you get this brilliant red. But those are the types of details that were lost. And um, regarding synthetic and aniline dyes, um, I showed a, a little piece from uh, E.B. Denham. Um, it is true that, that I, I think it is true that the aniline dyes were sort of the death knell of, of the Che industry in Sri Lanka. Um, uh, of course, uh, aniline dyes um, are invented right about mid-century, about 1850 in Europe, but it takes about three decades before um, inexpensive, ubiquitous aniline chemical synthetic dyes are, are found in South Asia and able to be used. Um, and so really the, the, the drop in the Che industry happens in the early 19th century. So I think it has to do with access to cochineal changing uh, in other markets. Um, uh, and shifts in 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 um, in the routes by which textiles are being produ produced. Um. I would like to add one point to that. Sorry, can I? Oh, I think you you know Mark rightly said the water plus the variety of cotton. We had the native variety cotton is completely gone. Of course, few are few varieties are surviving, but at that point of time, that definitely would have had an impact. That's a study which we are yet to do. Yeah, but that also is a contributing factor. So now going then to the labor side of it, you know, there's one thing about knowledge and, and, and distribution or, or passing on of knowledge and the loss of it, but about the labor itself, you know, this, the labor that might be around, the systems of labor around dying involve the planting, the growing, the harvesting, right, of the chair root itself. And so how do we connect systems of labor from the past to the present? And I guess, Mark, I'll, I'll have you start with this in terms of, you know, how you're thinking about that archival research that you're doing and, you know, um, the communities that you're talking to today. And um, I'm just looking at the questions are kind of coming in a little fast. Um, but um, one uh, panelist um, asked about, um, saying that we were told that children from Tamil Nadu as young as seven years of age were sought by the Dutch to be taken into slavery in Indonesia. And so there's these oral histories, you know, is that oral history true? There's oral histories as well about that, those past systems. And of course, the, the issue of caste looms large here uh, in how caste itself um, overlaps with the labor practices. So maybe Mark, we'll start with you and then go to Bessie. Yeah, yeah th thank you for the question. Um, there's a wonderful book that I can recommend to everyone uh, that's just come out by Nira Wickramasinghe from Leiden, um, who 
um, is, is charting more depth, it charting in more depth slavery in Ceylon than anyone has before. The book is called Slave in a Palanquin, Columbia University Press. Um, in that, she and, and in, in a previous essay with Alicia Schreiker point out that, that there is a um, intertwining, a legalistic intertwining between uh, a Roman Dutch conception of slavery and local caste practices that happen right about 1706, 1704, in the codification of a local local set of laws called de Sevelema, which in Tamil just it means country code or country uh, country law. Um, so, at in that moment, um, there is a collapsing of 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 a variety of labor relationships into um, something called slavery. Um, uh, in that moment. So there are a group of, of laboring castes who, did, who had various relationships to dominant castes who in this moment are defined as slaves um, uh, in a Roman Dutch sense, where defined as chattel slavery. So in this way, Jaffna and Ceylon differ significantly from, um, from the rest of India and from the Coromandel coast. And so the collection of, of dye root is significantly different in Ceylon than it is in the Coromandel Coast. So for instance, I wouldn't say that, that slaves picked dye root um, in the area around Danjavur um, because I don't think the evidence bears that out. So it's something closer to bonded labor. Um, uh, whereas in Ceylon, um, these people were purchased, they were owned, and at some point they are given some level of, of freedom. Um, um, we have examples where the Dutch say, um, we will tell the people that if they stay on the land um, and work and, and sort of bind themselves to the company, um, uh, we will release them, um, but they have to stay here. They can't go back. So, um, uh, so we, the, the exact, um, the layers of, of bondage and slavery and, and freedom, it gets extremely complicated. And of course, we're dealing with very, um, um, we're dealing with a, this palimpsest with this, um, this, this, this um, you know, it's like a textile that's been eaten away by moths and we're trying to figure out what the pattern looks like. Essie, do you want to add anything to that? I'm curious about how you might have a perspective on, on the kind of, things, the kind of labor patterns Mark has found in the archive. Can you read that in the textiles, some of the ones that you've looked at? Is there a way to recover some of that, that information? No, I have, I didn't look, uh, you know, that, that is one study which I didn't even, you know, look at. The slave, uh, sla the, the labor or the slave trade or whatever, uh, the bonded labor, nothing. The caste, I re really didn't look into that area. But one question, what you asked, uh, whether slave traded to, or, I mean, sent to Indonesia, but when it comes to red, there is no red in Indonesia at that point of time. It's more of brown, the blue and the brown. So I think in connection to the Che and the uh, labor trade, I don't think so there is anything, though I should confess, I haven't done any study, but. The textile itself speaks for it. Uh, I mean, you know, it's the study. It talks for itself. And observing that, I'm giving that answer. And so, uh, you know, there is the sense that in so many textile studies and particularly textile practices that are going on today, you know, revival is a big thing, right? Revival of the, the, the hand-produced or, or um, hand-crafted um, um, of, you know, textile kind of traditions. And I'm just wondering, like, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like a, you know, embraced as an unquestioned activity. And, you know, but as we consider the ethics of production, you know, which is the topic of, of today's program, is revival as straightforward a recovery project that we think it is? Can I answer that? You start, Bessie, please. <laughs> no, it is not. See, I would like the present scenario, I, I think we have to classify, even those days, they cultivated the che root in the Coromandel Coast. So today also the scenario, if it is cultivated dye, it is fine. 
otherwise going and just like that you know uprooting uh, the plants we are just uh, not helping the ecosystem there is no system at all and uh, particularly we there is no transparency when i go to a country medical i mean uh, shop um, a medicine shop i ask for some plants and they give and half of them are not even cultivated and i have to be very honest the how i collected itself was kind of not not very legal um because we are not allowed uh, to like i said we were not allowed to uh, pull out the plants so even when i collected the root uh, uh, plants for roots from kalingi forest i had to engage the tribal people because they are allowed but not us so often what happens i did did, did this for research it's not justifiable in the in real in reality what happens the middleman you know gets the gets the uh, plant from the tribal people and they sell it so there is you know i i don't think so revival we have to be very clear whether unless it is cultivated i don't think so you know i wouldn't look into it i wouldn't i really won't do it yeah mark do you have a perspective on this I do. Um, before before I tell you, I just wanted to um, follow up with the question about uh, slavery in the Indian Ocean, and and if if people are inter interested in that topic in general, there's a wonderful book by Richard Allen, uh, and the title is European Slave Trading in the Indian Ocean. Um, gives a um, a panoramic view of of the company trading, Dutch East India Company, British East India Company, and others, um, and the movements of people from from um, uh, South Africa and Sri Lanka uh, and Indonesia uh, and, and the benefit that, that colonial um, European companies um, made off of, off of the movement of, 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 um, of labor uh, and of people. Um, also, there's a book by Marcus Vink um, titled Encounters on the Opposite Coast, which has um, more on Dairut than, uh, uh, and, and, and Dairut and labor during the 17th century than, than has been written anywhere else. Um, and so I'll, I'll encourage you to look at both of those. Um, in terms of the question about uh, reclamation, um, I, the reason that I'm interested in trying to die with, with Che in part is, a, is, is because it's a puzzle. And, and the, as you pointed out uh, at some point earlier, um, you, you said that the, the, the efforts to um, capitalize on something and, and, and expand uh, capital um, in South Asia had the result of de destroying earlier um, um, economic structures. Um, you know, the, the desire to expand chemical dyes in South Asia had, had this dramatic impact on natural dyeing. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm compelled by, the, by this mystery and, um, and I'm compelled by the, the significance of its intricate um, of the intricate intricacy of it, because it's not um, to describe it as craft is to do it a great disservice, uh, and and there are social consequences of of this description of this work as craft. Um, uh, also, you know that gets back to the the diminu diminu diminutization of, of labor. Um, in my discussion with community members, um, you know that eighty one year old man could remember his his father in the 1940s dying with Che and his wife would pop in from the kitchen and add pieces, gendered aspects to the story, such as remembering how the women used to run their fingers through the thread-like roots in order to clear them of, of soil. And so um, one of the reasons to, to search for, um, to, to reclaim that lost story is to get at so much of the the remarkable brilliance um, that's embedded in those fabrics, intellectual creativity um, that that could otherwise be, um, you know, chalked up to just craft. Uh, what did you mean about him dying with Che? So, um, you know, I, he he said um, he said I remember. I was, so I, I use family stories in my work um, and memories about the past um, to interrogate the archive available. So um, according to what we know, 
there were no dye root diggers. There were no dyers with people dying with Che in Sri Lanka as of 1920. But this, I think, doesn't mean that it didn't happen. I think it did continue um, uh, probably to mid to mid 20th century, um, but in very small not in very small circumstances, not for commercial purposes. Um, but they didn't have any samples of uh, available because textiles in South Asia, as as we probably all know, get repurposed and and are are um, more ephemeral than than some other than than maybe some textiles in in other places. Um, so that that's the last that's that's the only example that I know of somebody having living memory of dying with with Che. I I haven't met anybody else who could definitively tell me that they've seen it. Um, done. Okay. Um, just um, turning to some of the questions from our audiences. Um, uh, one person was asking uh, about the nature of the plant today and what the uses are, uh, wondering if it was poisonous. Uh, and in fact, I, I love our audiences having a conversation on the chat amongst themselves too. Um, someone responded that it's medicinal. And I, I know, uh, Bessie, from talking with you earlier, you mentioned that also. So, you know, what is Che used for today? Um, is anybody come cultivating it and why? If it's no. not for dyeing, what else is it for? It's not cultivated anymore. I think cultivation stopped. Uh, we have no records at all. Now, uh, you know, at least for past hundred years, we have no trace of any cultivation. Even uh, 1850s, we don't have any um, uh, evidence of cultivation happening in Coromandel Coast anywhere here. And uh, I think by then, uh, they, uh, we, we it was more of adulteration that started happening by mid 19th century only by uh, end of uh, 19th century. I think we are done with uh, uh, Che root, but it was more of uh, Rubia cordifolia and uh, yeah, and uh, that was it. And now it is, when I went, you know, I took, a, took the help of a, a country doctor in Kalingi and he was saying, you know, this plant is, uh, highly medicinal and it's used for the snake bite. And uh, yes, it's very effective uh, medicinal plant. And I feel, you know, I am often connect this to, you know, textiles that were traded to Southeast Asia. They have this thing saying, you know, they have the magical property. Probably they kept an insect away. Probably there was some medicinal thing and the, you know, value to the, even the dyed textile. So probably that is an analysis which I'm. I think at some point I would like to do. Like Mark said, I would you know one point if I would like to uh, revive Che is because I don't want to lose the knowledge system that our ancestors had in this land, and it's a pride of the country. Oh, just for that reason alone, yes, I would like to see the results and, and the medicinal properties. Of course, another part of it. Yeah. So that's the thing, yeah, it has medicinal value. I think that it also has a styptic property where it will stop blood, um, blood flow. Um, Bessie was the first person to show me the plant in Chennai. And then I also had to get a Siddhavaitya of like a country doctor to, um, to take me out to show me where I could find the plant in Jaffna. Mm. <clears throat> so we talked about the styptic property so you could make it into a poultice and then put it on a, a wound to stop it from bleeding. So it sounds like the medicinal properties are, are the, the uses for it today, at least. And even though it's not cultivated, at least it's gathered to be used for medicinal properties from being grown in the wild. Um, someone else also asks exactly what labor is involved in getting che root. You know, you, you both kind of held up long, stringy, dried plants and you know, before I had actually seen the, the physical plan, I, I was actually thinking, you know, a root kind of a, a thick tubular thing. And I mean, what kind of labor is involved in this about pulling it up? And I would imagine it breaks easily, but I'm not sure. So can, can you describe that? Let's see. Mark, you should answer okay. that. Because you well, did it. I did it, but not as effective as you, what you well, did. I'll tell you that fine filament that is the root, um, Bessie said it's sometimes between a meter and two meters. It means that you are up to your shoulder in the in the, the sandy or clayey soil trying to get down to the bottom and it breaks so easily. It means that you're, you know, having to be extremely careful. Um, the, 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 
period of time that people would pick um, or collect or dig root was um, tied to the weather because you really couldn't do it until after the first rains had come and loosened the soil. Um, uh, it is extremely labor intensive. Um, you're also, of course, in the fields with the five types of venomous snakes in Jaffna that, that are you know, responsible for deaths every year. Um, uh, it's, it, it's really backbreaking labor, labor and to think of the kind of labor it would take to produce 250,000 pounds of this root um, is sort of jaw dropping and not surprising that it would require um, enslavement to make that possible. Anything you want to add, Bessie? No, uh, I uh, digging even one plant I couldn't. But mm. Mark he sent a photograph, and so it was like, like he said, his hand he goes like that. But I couldn't do that kind of uh, digging. But uh, yeah, so I just I, the max I was able to do, you know. Uh, six seven inches that's it mm. that is still with great difficulty yeah well we're at the end of our hour um and i just want to thank both of you and thank our audiences for really a, a very engaging hour um i um uh, want to encourage all of you to come see our, our exhibitions when the rom reopens the Cloth That Changed the World and Florals, Desire and Design. Um, I will leave with you with one thought as well. This is something that Mark, Bessie and I were talking about as we were preparing for today, which is how does this information change the way you experience the textiles in the gallery? Does it make you look at those gorgeous textiles with the deep reds that were the desire um, of everybody around the globe differently? You know, and, and how to reconcile um, some of that information about the labor practices with the aesthetics um, uh, as you go through the exhibition. So I, I hope that the conversation today uh, um, changes the way you experience um, the textiles in whatever way that might be. Um, so thank you all for joining us. We hope to see you again for our next Curator Conversations on June 23rd. There's two more chintz related programs that are part of this series, one per month through the summer um, and details for all of these upcoming programs and, and others will, can be found online at the ROM at Home portal found on the ROM website and also through our social media channels um, if you follow them. So Bessie and Mark, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving thank this you. opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dipali. Goodbye, everybody.